Uh, you're listening to the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Greg Szymanski. Two hours. Two hours with uh, great interviews all the time. We get into the news behind the scenes that the uh, mainstream media refuses to cover. What a shame. Uh, let me just update some things before I tell you who my guest is today. I've been promoing it all week, and we're going to get deep inside the family, the order, the Illuminati, uh, today for two hours. And uh, you got to stay with us from the beginning to the end of this interview. Okay, we're back. It's eight minutes after the hour, and uh, we're going to get deep inside the Illuminati, the family, the order. We have a guest uh, that was involved with this group, uh, born into it uh, for over 30 years, and uh, her name is Zvali. Zvali, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Well, it's nice to have you here, and I know you don't give radio interviews, and I really want to thank you because I think it really does help the American people understand about this uh, secret organization that you were born into. So I guess before we, uh, you know, I guess we can just start from the beginning and tell us uh, uh, right from the beginning you were born into this from wealthy parents, and tell us about your training in this group and uh, uh, when you were a young child and then up into your orientation at the Vatican. Go ahead. That's a pretty broad area, though, Greg. I mean, that could take okay. hours, if you know what I mean. Um, yes, but, but do you know, just uh, if you yeah. could just outline it for us. Yeah. I mean, I was born in a group. I was born in Germany, came to the U.S. very young, um, and basically went through um, all the training that the group, all members of the group do under uh, training to different degrees, depending on the role. Um, after... Uh, by the time I was a teenager, I was a youth leader, and by the time I was uh, 22, I became the youngest member of leadership council in San Diego County. And at that time, I was a head trainer. Um, I was the sixth trainer. I eventually moved up to the second position. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 12, I I had mentioned with you the ceremony in at the Vatican. Uh, that they right. really do make all, all leadership in the group undergo at some point. Now, uh, can you now basically when you were growing up, I remember you told me that you were instilled at a young age. Uh, you were born to a very wealthy, uh, well-to-do family. You moved yes. back to the states. You were told at a very young age you were special. You were chosen. Uh, cor uh, correct. Well, they tell everyone in the group that they're special and chosen. And, in fact, that's one of the things that made me very cynical when I was older is that, you know, I mean, you will never meet a person who's an Illuminati who's not been told and programmed for years that they're special, they're the only one that can do things for, quote, unquote, family. But I was told, yes, you know, I would do great things for family one day. And um, the reason why, I guess, I can filter some of this with objective view is I know what my role in the group was, and it was over quite a significant number of other people. So I don't evaluate what I my role or specialness within the group not so much by what I was told, but what by what I did. So you reach the age of 12, and then you're told by your parents you're going to an induction ceremony in the Vatican. Uh, can you yeah. tell us uh, how that happened and what? occurred at that ceremony when you went there? Okay. Um, this isn't easy to talk about, as you know. Um, when I was 12, uh, I was going over to Germany, and I was at, I'll call him the German father's house over there, and there was some preparation for a few days beforehand, and I was told that there would be a very important ceremony, and it was considered a sealing ceremony at that point, and Basically, I was told a little bit about what I was expected to do during the ceremony. You know, when we got there, um, we went to the Vatican. Um, there's underneath the Vatican, there's a, there's a large room that I described to you when we talked before. Um, it's it it has 13 catacomb chambers leading into it with with, and what they do is is they as you go down these these steps into the the room. You can see that they're, they're, it's almost circular, and so they're all around it, and they bring out mum, the mummies from the catacombs, and they set them beside each one, and they say that the spirits of the fathers watching over the ceremony. And during the ceremony, I, I, there was a large table in the center of the room. It was it was on top of a huge golden pentagram, and um, and they had a, a ceremony there. You know, they. Um, Okay, now how many kid, uh, how many other children were with you uh, being inducted into uh, the family or the order, as uh, the, they call it? There were there were two other children. 
at that point. And there were, but there were several adults too. Okay. Um, see, the church also brings in adults for to swear their allegiance too. Just so you know, um, if my I was told, and I don't know if this is true, but if you want to rise to a certain position within the Catholic Church hierarchy, you do have to go through that ceremony as well. Okay, so you're down in this room with uh, your parents weren't present. Uh, no, no, the German you, father and the French father were. Yeah. Okay, and at that point, uh, tell our listeners what you witnessed. Well, um, there was a, a table. It looked like um, dark glass in the center of the room. I mean, it, it was made of F stone, but it was very shiny and dark and black. And it may have been something like obsidian or onyx. I'm not sure. You know, I'd have to. Um, that's the only time I've seen stone like that. And it had, uh, like, around the, the corners, it had, like, these gold um I guess channels that, 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 you know, to collect fluids and, uh, little boy was placed in the center of the table on drugs. He was, I think he was drugged because he was very quiet. He didn't move or say anything during the ceremony. This was a little three or four year old boy. Yes. Correct? Yeah. And then yeah. they continued to, go ahead, they continued to do a child sacrifice. Yes. Right they in did. Front of they you. Did. Yes. Yeah. I told you about that before. Yeah. Now, yeah. afterwards, uh, quite, what a, you know, unbelievable uh, experience for a youth, I mean, for a 12-year-old. I mean, I, I just thought, uh, how, what was, what went through your mind, I guess, when that happened? I mean, uh, I was terrified. I mean, I was absolutely horrified. I, 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 I can't describe the terror you feel when you go through something like that. And do you remember the words they were saying as this was going on? The man was in scarlet. He was speaking in Latin, and basically he he was saying, you know, please accept the sacrifice, you know, on this day. But then, you know, and then he said the sacrifice will seal the seal the ceremony, and then he he did it. Again, I was so terrified that <sighs> have, have you ever been in a situation where your 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 heart's racing? But you can't do anything, and so you're just kind of sitting there, and, and you're kind of like fading in and out. That's, well, you that's know, kind of, I can remember as a youth being frightened, but I don't think I've ever uh, no. All right. well, gone through anything all quite right. well, like that you Yeah, have. imagine your heart rate going up to about two, 220. You can't move, so you're kind of shaking, but trying like not to show it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I mean, it was horrible. And I actually, I was keep, keep thinking inside, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, you don't say this inside. You're just kind of saying over and over, I can't wait till it's over. I can't wait till it's over. I can't wait till mm -hmm. it's over. Afterwards, um, the, the man in Scarlet, he had a huge golden ring on his hand. And he came over to the center of the room. And he had each each of the people that were swearing that day, I had to go forward and kneel before him and kiss his ring and swear my allegiance to the new new order, to the new world order. For all, until my death. Hmm. Now, and at that point, at that point, you are escorted out. Uh, yes. Yeah. And after the what, ceremony was all over, I mean, the other people also did theirs as well. You know, they had to swear uh -huh. their allegiance too. And, then and they, they were said, what the same age as they were the same age as you. The two children were, but there, there were also three adults that went forward and did the same. And afterwards, um, we were told. May the same to you or worse occur should you ever break this oath. Hmm. So it's basically, okay. uh, whew, imagine at that age, what's, what's, uh, uh, and you weren't you really prepped for this, were you? I mean, you were told there was a ceremony, but nothing, you didn't expect anything like this, uh, from what no, I gathered. Well, talking I, to I, it, 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 it was very difficult to go through just because the sense of horrific oppression down there, too, was the worst. I, I mean, I've gone through some ceremonies in my life in the Illuminati. You, you do go through them. But I have to say that in my experience, this was the worst just because I can't explain the amount of darkness in a room like that, just as pure evil. And unless you've ever been in, 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 in a seeing oppression, I mean, it's just horrible. It wasn't just what happened, but just, I mean, the, the oppression and I'm a Christian now, and I know the difference now between when there's evil present, oppression, or, or when God's love is present and joy and peace, which is the exact opposite of what was in that room.
Now, you know what I find quite interesting about this? Uh, about 25 years ago, I was a reporter and a freelance writer in Rome, and I spent six years there. I walked through the Vatican many, many times, uh, hundreds of times, covered the papal addresses, things like that. And during that time, I was there during a Vatican scandal, uh, which involved the church uh, bank and other things, uh, members of the Illuminati, the Freemasons. Uh, I was approached by a woman on Via Veneto. I'll never forget this. Uh, Rome's a small town, and people knew I was covering stories about the secret societies, things like that, because I had to ask people. Well, this woman came up to me and told me similar stories. Uh, she wasn't quite as specific because she couldn't handle it. She would break out crying. Yeah. And it tried to commit suicide twice because she couldn't get out of the Illuminati. She was a member, a young, she was, again, born into it, a, a fairly, a very wealthy Italian, northern Italian family. And uh, she told me basically the same ceremony uh, took place with her. And so when I started talking to you, I wanted to relay that to you and to also relate to my listeners that I heard about this 25 years ago. Uh, from a woman by the name of Maria and many other people, several other people in Italy that I talked to. Uh, I was never able to uh, uh, locate or really, probably for my own safety, never find out what happened. But again, Svali's uh, corroborating a story that I heard about 25 years ago. We'll get back after this break with this incredible story about a member of the Illuminati who's now uh, out of the group and safe on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Okay, uh... We're back on the Investigative Journal. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Greg Szymanski. We're talking to Zvali, a member of the family, uh, the Order, the Illuminati for over 30 years. Uh, Zvali, you leave the induction ceremony, uh, you walk out into the Vatican courtyard, and what do uh, you leave with one of the fathers, I believe? What did he tell you then? At that point, he just told me to never forget that, you know, he told me that I performed well during the ceremony because I didn't scream or, you know, uh, pass out or, or anything like that. So he, he said, you do very well, and he was pleased. And then we went and stayed at, at a home nearby, a, a local, um, it must have been a local person. I didn't know them. We spent the night there before we went back to Germany. Okay, and what about the other people during the ceremony? How did they handle themselves? Do you remember? <sighs> I'm going to say, unfortunately, I'm so... Um, and when you're in that kind of situation, the last thing they're thinking about sometimes is what the other people are doing. <laughs> I was just so trying to not, like, lose it myself. And and that I, I do know that, I mean, no one screamed or shouted, you know, or anything like that. Everyone was quiet. I think to say dead silence is, unless the person was spoken to, is true. Or unless mm -hmm. they, they had to go forward and kiss the ring. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. I think we, uh, uh, yeah. uh, the question I wanted to ask you, and this is such a wide subject. I've had a chance to talk to you a number of, number of uh, days, and I've done some stories about it. Uh, you go back home. You're 12 years old. You said you were schooled in the 12 disciplines. So your life begins, uh, and you know now you're in some type of organization that isn't, uh, that is very different than uh, what most people experience. But tell us, you know, I guess what I want to do is leave it open to you to begin. I mean, you've written so in-depth on this story. We're, uh, I'm just going to give you the microphone and let you begin and tell, uh, tell, tell the listeners what you think is important about your original training, about the group, and about, uh, uh, you know, many things that I know people want to know about the Illuminati. Okay. Go ahead. Well, Greg, first I want to say that my purpose in, in talking about this is not to glorify evil, because there, there are very wicked people out there, very powerful people. And I don't want to at all magnify their power, but I want, do want people to know that this is real, that these people exist, that people who say there are people out there that are involved in these activities, it really happens. Um, I also, because I know that there are children being hurt, in the group every day, and that's my motivation for coming forward. Um, I don't like giving interviews for obvious reasons. Um, but I'm willing this one time to lay aside my thoughts of personal safety to, because these people need to be stopped. It needs to be stopped. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. And 
Normally, children in, in the group are born into it. Uh, while the Illuminati very rarely does outside recruitment, that's not their main method. It's just passed down generally, generationally from father to son and mother to daughters to children until the whole family line is, is in it. Um, throughout the centuries, people have tried to escape, but um, a lot of times they were um, either poisoned, murdered, or set up to look like a suicide. They, they don't like it when people leave, and they try to make it very difficult, simply because um, it looks bad. <laughs> they go through an enormous amount of training from the time you're an infant. You, you undergo indoctrination. And when I say indoctrination, I don't just mean like cult programming so much as watching your parents and seeing what they do. My parents modeled their behavior. To them, the group was very important to growing up. I saw that three times a week, Everything was dropped to attend to the activities. Okay. Okay. Um, what a lot of and after through basically the, the the training process is designed to help you take on your adult role in the group. The Illuminati covers so many levels though too. It goes all the way from what most people think of as like a satanic coven type thing at the very low local level. All the way through, it's a huge, enormous business corporation. At the mid-levels, you have people overseeing finances and administration um, who are overseeing. I mean, these people are making a lot of money through gun running, through white slavery, prostitution, pornography. They have links and ties to the mafia left and right. And, in fact, the mafia are afraid of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, but but because they know that you don't cross the you know the members of the group, they have a very spiritual orientation. They're not satanic, though. They're, they're Luciferian, which is a difference. But mm -hmm. the ultimate goal of, of their spiritual philosophy and their steps of discipline is they believe that that should you complete all your training, that you become a god. That is their actual end goal. They believe in the achievement of godhood of a luminous philosophy through different means, through what they call enlightenment or illumination, which is how they got their name. Mm -hmm. um, they're international. Um, uh, in Europe, there's uh, 12 fathers who sit that represent the different nations of Europe. Um, they are very expectantly awaiting he who is to come. And during that ceremony in the Vatican, I... I on my knees, I had to swear my allegiance to serve he who is to come. Hmm. They believe so, Alec, can you, uh, I have to take a break. We'll continue sure. with the, uh, the, the massive organization. Your role as a mid, uh, mid level person in the uh, Illuminati on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Okay, we're back on the Investigate yeah, Journal, and I'm uh, talking with Zvali. Uh, Zvali, why don't we just pick it right up where we left off at the break? Uh, you were telling us about this hierarchy that it starts with 12 fathers. Can you just run that down for us so people know exactly how this group's organized? Sure. Um, at the top levels, it's, it's in Rome. That's the center or the heart of the Illuminati. That's where the power base is. And that's why um, all leadership must wear a fealty in Rome because that, that's considered the core of, of, of the spiritual center of the universe is how they view it. From there, um, in Europe, there are 12 fathers, one for each country in Europe. Um, when I was younger, too, I had to also I would meet with the fathers um, at one point and kiss their rings and go to another ceremony of allegiance to them as well. Um, there's, uh, in the Illuminati, the European fathers, though, rule over what are called the different houses. For instance, if you're from Germany, then you belong to the German house. If you're from France, you belong to the French house. They call them houses. Um, UK, Russia, Poland, Belgium, um, Spain, Italy, um, and others. Um, from there, uh, America was considered a mission field for them. And in the 17, or actually in the 1600s, uh, Pittsburgh became the first port of entry for them, and that's where they first settled, and so that's why it's still considered a, a spiritual power base for the group on the East Coast in the U.S. You know, and I did want to mention one thing. Uh, and a caller or a listener, a reader of your stories, sent me an email, said, uh, Greg, 
check into the reason why Bush, uh, President Bush, right after being elected, went to Pittsburgh and talked uh, to a Masonic group there. Uh, I found that quite interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the spiritual power base for, for the group. From there, um, it spread out, it, um, of course, to the Atlantic Seaboard and, and then throughout the nation. And the while the nation is divided into many regions, uh, multiple regions, seven main regions, the East East Coast region has its spiritual power base in Pittsburgh, but the administrative power base is in Alexandria, Virginia. That's where they administer the finances during the day-to-day operation. The West Coast or the West region or west of the Mississippi has its power base in the San Diego area. And that's where um, you spent a lot of time, correct? Yes. Yes, I was okay. sent from the Alexandria Council sent me to San Diego to help them out. Okay, okay um, go ahead. Let's see. Those are the t- the two, of course, main regions, and then each of those regions are divided into sub-regions. And so then you have your regional council sitting over those and overseeing activities. I mean, if you can think of the structure of a large multinational corporation, that's really how the Illuminati is structured. Then beneath each of the regional councils are your local councils. They call them sister groups or sister, or your local councils, and then you have your local groups under those as well, your, or what they call the sister groups. So um, any major metropolitan city could have anywhere from 5 to 15 groups, depending on the size population base. Now, you were saying that uh, uh, how many people um, are in this group in America about, from your estimate uh, of knowing a lot of this stuff? Go ahead. Pure Illuminati, I'd say about one percent, give or take. They so you you look it's a fairly uh, big organization, correct? Yes. Oh yeah. Now they're you know just in the in the uh, their goal basically just give us the over, the broad overview goal and then I want to get into some of these uh, uh, you know your role in it and uh, some of these uh, re, uh, ways that the Illuminati makes money that you learned about. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, when you say to rule the world, it almost sounds laughable, like, yeah, right. You know, I think people get ideas of, like, thinking in the brain, wanting to rule the world. But really, that is their goal. They believe that they are the intelligent leaders, and they believe that the rest of the world are sheep who need, need wise. They see themselves as wise leadership, so they they believe that their goal is, is to rule the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, but at the same time, um, they have ways of doing this. Their main methods of doing so are behind the scenes. They believe in infiltration of the media, of education, and of government. Those are the three areas, and of the financial system. And they've successfully done quite a bit of all four throughout Europe and the U.S., as well as other countries. Now, you said that they, you're basically the uh, Illuminati is divided into about six or seven different groups, and everyone is born into a group. Can you outline what those groups are? Well, no, it's, it's all one group, but it just has different levels, you know. Yeah, um, that's what I mean, like the yeah. sciences, the government. Oh, 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 uh, well, it's, no, okay, the Illuminati is divided into different branches of learning. And okay. th- these branches include sciences, military, government, leadership, scholarship, and spiritual. Those okay. are the six branches of learning. And while all children need to undergo some training or teaching in, in each area, as they get older, they, they, they begin profiling you from infancy, and they know where your aptitudes and abilities are. Then you are you really go into you, most people specialize in, in one branch or possibly two branches of learning. And you were involved in what branch? I was heavily involved in sciences. And also, uh, to some degree, uh, I did some spiritual as well, but mainly hey, sciences. I, just to backtrack one minute, these 12 disciplines, as a child, you were uh, rigorously trained in this, correct? Yes. Okay. And what were those disciplines?
were those disciplines? I mean, if just uh, you don't have to go through each one of them, but what primarily were you taught? Um, I think the best way would be to just give you an example of just one one type of training that they do. Okay. When I, I was two years old, I was left in a room for probably a 24-hour period. When you're that age, it's hard to estimate, but it was a long time. I know that the sun did go around <laughs> at least once. You know, it wasn't just like a few hours. And at that age, when you're two and you're left completely alone without food and water, you're terrified. And at the end of the the, the um, time, I was I was just dying of thirst. I remember I was just I, I've never been so thirsty in my entire life. And my mother worked, walked into the room because a lot of times they have the children, you know, or the parents as train the children at these early ages. And there was a table in the middle of the room, and I'm sitting at it. And she sits at it, and she brings in this cold pitcher of water, and she starts pouring it. I said, Mom, I want a drink of water. And she slapped me out of the chair. Hmm. And I remember crying. And I'm like, and, and, and as I'm crying, and she's drinking the water in front of me, then she leaves. She takes a pitcher of water. And a couple of hours later, she came back in and did the same thing. I said, Mama, Mama, I want water. And she slapped me, I mean, across the room. And after this had happened about three times, luckily I was bright enough that by the third time she came in, I mean, I remember crying silently. I just looked at her. I didn't ask. And after she got up and left with the pitcher, then, then a, man, a man came into the room. He said, you did very well that time. And then he gave me a drink of water. Hmm. And I thought, you know, this, that was part of the learning not to want stage. And looking back on it, I rise now as an, an adult, but the purpose of that, that training was to teach me not to recognize my own physiological needs and respond to them, but to look to outside people to tell me what I wanted or needed. Which now, is, you basically... Is uh, you know, you told me that you led kind of a dual life in the Illuminati. I mean, that's basically how they function. They have a, oh, yeah. Yeah. a day job, and then at nighttime you're quite oh, busy yeah. sometimes with the cult's activities, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to get into, uh, if you, you know, you were talking about these groups. I remember I mentioned to you, uh, you were going, you said you had meetings three times a week. And I said, well, what about if I wanted to go and visit and uh, maybe do a story about them? What? Uh, what would happen, or how could would I be able to find one of these meetings uh, that were going on where in your area of Escondido? Well, no, because of the security measures. And a, you really don't want to show up unannounced at a meeting if you could get through their security, because chances are you would never make it out alive. Let's just okay. say that a sudden auto accident would occur, and be reported in the papers. Unfortunate accident, man accidentally <laughs> runs into tree. I mean, I'm serious. I'm. Not. But the security that they have during group meetings is, is so intense that it would be very difficult. They have uh, security at the one-mile perimeter, the three-mile perimeter, and the five-mile perimeter. They have um, three people assigned, usually one like up in a tree where you can't see them, at the, mm -hmm. um, the five-mile perimeter. And then you have one person who's standing who looks like a security guard for this state because he's off the march with these states, which is appropriate, and he's dressed in the uniform. And the third person's standing behind, hidden behind a tree. As cars come through and they come through the gates, because remember, these are, off, these are gated estates. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if it's not someone on their approved license checklist, they will stop the car and they say, it's, it's, it's just like at a military um, installation. They'll say, can I help you? Are you lost? Their goal is to delay the person. Now, if the person saying, oh, is this blah, 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 and they're, in the, and, they, and they're just asking directions, they'll give them directions. They'll be very pleasant when they're supposed to be going. But if they are acting as if they want to go further into the state, and this is not an okay person, then the person, they will say, uh, all right, well, let's, 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 you can say he's not expecting you. That's a code word. That tells the person either behind, up in the tree, hidden, or else behind, hidden further back. They radio ahead and they say, unexpected visitor. At that point, everyone would, has been trained to pick up and leave immediately within five minutes. No traces of the activity. Hmm. So this is, this is some of the methods they go through so you don't get caught. 
I know that uh, you wrote an article about why the occult doesn't get caught, and that's oh, yeah. pretty specific. I mean, you have so much stuff here, and we can't get into it all in two hours. So please pick and choose what you think is most important. But I found that to be interesting, uh, why the occult doesn't get caught. Is there anything in just a brief uh, time you could explain to us uh, that? Well, their security, their money, their influence. Uh, some of these people even own newspapers. Imagine trying to get a, a, a article published, you know, disclosing. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they don't get caught, because that's the first thing people ask. But then my next question is, how many child pornographers are out there that the police have been chasing for years and have never found or caught? Correct. And, the, and, the, and they're not even members of a secret organization. They're just trying to hide, you know. So mm -hmm. when you now you, okay. Yeah, you are a mid-level person in this organization, a head trainer. We're going to get into those specifics in the next hour. But you know, uh, what did you learn about the infiltration of this group into all of our different areas of government, uh, media? Uh, they're basically at the high levels of most of our financial institutions, also correct. Yeah. And that is a, a great way to uh, pursue their goal. And I guess i got to ask you this. Why, how come things are moving a little bit uh, faster in America now? I remember back in the 80s when I was uh, confronted with this, uh, when I came back home, I didn't really see uh, this kind of New World Order movement, all this different symbolism that you see now. Uh, what is going on, just for our listeners, uh, right now, why are things stepped up since 9/11? I believe it's because they see they can see the fulfillment of their goal. Of see, I, I'm going to sound very cynical now, and okay. please forgive me for this. But see, their goal is to rule the world, and personally, I believe that they do. It's just not open yet, mm -hmm. and they see now preparing people for when they disclose it themselves openly. Does that mean that they can't be stopped? I believe they could. I believe they'd take a miracle because of the amount of infiltration I've seen at all levels of society and the world. These guys have, a, these people have, and women have a lot of money. They have a lot of influence. And your average person has no idea of, of how much that they, is going on behind the scenes that no one understands. But with that said, so basically, I mean, I think that they're already there. They just aren't. Open, you people just don't know what they're doing. If they did, I think the average person would be horrified to know how much is going on behind the scenes that people really don't know. Yeah, and the point of this interview, one, I had two point, uh, two goals but, but, in this interview. But, but, but I don't Go want ahead. to sound despairing because I, I'm also a strong Christian. I have faith in God, and I believe that through prayer and through people knowing that, I mean, I, I would like them to be stopped. I just don't know at this point, how do you take on the financial institutions of the world, the, the major oil enterprises of the world? <laughs> you know, that's the question. Yeah, you know, it is, it is a, it's a difficult question. Now, you're in the mid-level of this group. You worked your way up to a head trainer, correct? Yeah, yeah. Now, what did you learn? Uh, before we get into the specifics, you, you outlined in some of your writings the big money-making uh, uh Oh, the ways these, uh, this group makes its money. Can you go over and outline some of those uh, methods? Um, again, if you can think of an illegal activity, they're probably involved at some point, maybe not overtly at, at the point of where the actual money is first changing hands. But any, when you have child pornography, prostitution, white slavery, gun running, gambling, um, then at some point, where the money's changing hands, about four, buffered by about four layers of people, there's going to be probably someone from the Illuminati involved at that point. These guys have their fingers in everything. Um, now, go ahead. But they also use legitimate means. They launder their money. I mean, when you have a lot of money, you have to do something with it. And so what they'll quite, they, I mean, these men don't come in and say, hi. I'm a member of the Illuminati, and I want to, like, run your bank. But what they'll do is they'll quietly come in and become a, a quiet investor, start buying up shares, and over a period of maybe almost a lifetime, they will get a controlling interest in the bank. So it's become a very, you know, and maybe in their son's lifetime, because that's the other thing about the Illuminati. The Illuminati do not see it as it must happen now in my lifetime. These people have goals that last for a century or two centuries. They're very, very patient. 
And that's why the specific training of the children is so important, correct? Yes. Yes, it's to teach you patience. Everyone mm-hmm. knows growing up in the group, they know that we may not see the coming order disclosed or open or revealed in that lifetime, but our children or our grandchildren may. So they will spend their entire life trying to bring about the goals of the organization. <laughs> Incredible. So now you're in the uh, mid-level, and I can see now where they use the uh, programming techniques, the different mind control techniques. Yeah. Uh, we had a minute before the break, just kind of uh, what our interest about how you, uh, what your specific uh, role was. Well, they did a lot of what you might call human experimentation. And they had a lot of research protocols going on. So one thing I did was to supervise the research going on. I was, I was teaching the younger trainers and, and head trainers how to do things more efficiently, how to do their job well, but also reviewing their research reports for errors or problems. Eventually, um, I became kind of a consultant. If a problem occurred or if they, were, they didn't know how to install something or if they needed assistance, I would help them with, with problem solving as well. Okay, Zvali, I'm going to attempt to take a break. We'll be back in three minutes. We'll continue. One thing I find interesting, Zvali, is, you know, in the media, uh, you know, I'm not going to name names or anything else. I don't have any specific information. But I find it interesting uh, doing some background checks and a lot of the top media people in our country, they all come from these very wealthy families. And, uh, you know, that's not the typical M.O. for a journalist, uh, a journalist is somebody, uh, you know, grows up on the street, wants to, wants to talk to people. I mean, I, I can think of Jimmy Breslin, uh, guys who uh, never went to college, uh, didn't know how to type, and just got in there and took their tie off and started writing stories. But, you know, as you look at the media now, these are all these silver spoon kids growing up with silver spoons. I find that quite interesting. How deeply infiltrated, from your knowledge, are they in our media? Wow. Um, pretty, I mean, I do know uh, fairly deeply. Uh, I remember that when I was in San Diego on leadership council during meetings, they would laugh about how people had no idea of how much they were, they were being influenced and didn't even know it. They, they found that kind of amusing, which is, I mean, that's the mindset of people in the group. Though, is they're like, the sheep have no idea that they're being led by the men. And right. they find it amusing because they show it as evidence of this. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm just describing what they say. I don't agree with it now, but they, they saw it as evidence of the stupidity of the, of the average person that they have no idea. Um, I'm not saying that every news story or every newscaster is a member of the group by no means. And but there's they specifically do teach and train and educate children to show an aptitude for it for the media. Because they want that. And if a person has a bright, charismatic personality and presents well, then that's just a, a that child will go into that if, if, you know, if they have the verbal communication and other skills required. Correct. And, you know, that uh, could explain why a lot of our stories really never get covered outside of the influence they have financially that's and the ownership of the media. Absolutely not by coincidence. Uh, what's not that? A, not at all a coincidence. Yeah, so I mean that's a, uh, a good idea why folks you're not getting the news from those outlets. I mean we have uh, not only in our government it explains you know a lot of things. I mean why look at the war in Iraq. Look at the you know the the evidence there that shows that it was wrong. Look at what they're doing in Iran right now. I mean it's incredible uh, uh, all this stuff. Uh, it's pretty obvious people you know there's something behind it. Zvali is here trying to explain this organization from her knowledge, and it's quite quite a story. Uh, I know this idea. You were involved as a trainer, mind programming. I mean, this is just. I'm looking at some of the uh, chapters in a book you have yet to publish. I mean, we're talking about brainwave, uh, color control, uh, metal, jewel programming, programming linked to stories, movies. Uh, I mean, it goes suicidal program. Uh, in just a minute here before I break. Uh, can you kind of break down what you learned about the importance? Well, oh, we got to take a break, Zvali. Sorry. We're going to do that quickly. Then we'll get back to you. Uh, we're talking to Zvali regarding her role as a head trainer in the Illuminati and the American uh, uh, Illuminati. We'll be back on the Republic Broadcasting Network in two minutes. Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal. Uh, one more hour, we're talking to Zvali, and she was a head trainer in the Illuminati. Uh, Zvali, how, uh, 
type of programming uh, do they actually under uh, do they actually teach you, and how do you learn these uh, different techniques? Um, well, you're you're taught from childhood on. I my training in how to be a programmer was very young. I was mentored by another programmer at the age of five uh, by uh, a doctor at George Washington University, and he. He not only did he do the programming on me, but he also taught me how to do it to others. Um, the types of programming, again, that could be a whole 10-hour segment to go into depth. Um, just briefly, it I mean, from the time a child's an infant, all through their life, basically, they're tested, they're profiled, they... The, um, Trainers can create a psychological profile, and then they update it frequently. And basically, they're trying to install in the child the ability to obey, loyalty to the group, and the ability to do their job within the, the group. Now, those jobs vary in complexity. I mean, you may have uh, on one side a child trained to be a, a prostitute. On the other end, you may have someone, a child trained to become a governmental figure which is a lot more complex programming. But as long as the loyalty to the group is instilled first, and that's the first and foremost programming always installed, then no matter what their eventual role is, they will they will remain loyal, and that becomes their first loyalty. Whatever nation, whatever um, their, their public role in life is, their first and foremost loyalty will be to the group and to serve its, its goals, whether they know... A lot of times the goal of the two is, is to be able to uh, help the child create that complete division between their day role and their night role. So a pleasant, charming, wonderful, kind person in the daytime could be an absolutely cold, ruthless person at night or, or during the day. You know, it's also during the day they do it. They may, um, you may have a housewife with children who goes out and completes a courier job for the group. And no one would ever suspect her. Who said this, this frumpy looking little housewife with a, a baby in a car seat is actually carrying some valuable document? Or, um, again, I mean, the, the first and foremost, though, is they want to instill loyalty and they want to discourage people from questioning orders. That's, they really don't want you questioning that and they want you to obey their directives, and should people show signs of not doing that, then they go in for tips. You're, you're, actually, people are being programmed all through their life. We used to call them tune-ups, you know, and um, it, it's a lifelong process for members of the group. So, you know, we have a minute here before our break, and then we'll get back and get in-depth in some of these areas, but uh, what went wrong with you? I mean, the dropout rate probably is very low uh, considering the number of, considering the, the training, but what went wrong with you? They somehow uh, missed, the, missed something. When I was very young, I was I absolutely believed in the goals of it. You never saw a more loyal group member. I thought that they were saving the world. I thought that, that, that they were doing a wonderful thing. But the older I got, I started to see the methods that were being used were so wrong and that the end did not justify the means. I became increasingly cynical, partly because I saw what I was doing to people. I was lying to them. I was manipulating them. I was telling them things that weren't true. And I remember questioning this, thinking, I was told lies as a child, too, then. I was manipulated. And finally, wow. you know, things like that, you start to question as an adult the things you believe. Okay. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a bit, uh, break, so Zavali. We'll be back in three minutes uh, on the Republic broadcast uh, on the Investigative Journal. Uh, Zavali, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, before we get into how you finally left the group and uh, what happened to you afterwards, your life now, tell us, uh, you wrote an article, it was kind of interesting, A Day in the Life of a Trainer for the Illuminati. Tell us kind of what you went through in a normal day uh, in your role at the Illuminati. Go ahead. Okay. Basically... I would get up. Um, I, at the time that I described in that article, I was teaching at a Christian school. And so I would get up. Uh, I, I would get my two children and I dressed ready for school. Um, look just like a normal mom, you know. Uh, go through the day, come home. You know, we'd have little friends over and play and stuff like that. And, and 
then, uh, uh, you know, have dinner. You know, I, I was a, I was a good mom. I was your average American housewife. I mean, on the surface. Okay. But but underneath the surface, then my husband and I would remind each other on nights when there was a meeting. And then what we would do is is when we go to sleep, I I have I had programming in place that would allow me to wake up within ten minutes of a specified time. So if I knew there was a meeting that night, I would wake up. Ten minutes before it was time to, you know, get ready and go. A lot of times we would even go to bed with our clothes on, and I never thought that was that normal. You know, mm-hmm. I thought everyone went to bed with their clothes on. Didn't even question it. You know, on nights when we had meetings, I thought, oh, it's warmer. <laughs> okay. And then we we get up and, and go and um, drive to the meeting. And I was also very involved in military in San Diego. In fact, the group has a lot of military orientation, and so a lot of times I would. Have uh, take the kids to their area. There's the area where the kids would go and change. They had a room, and we would have, like, baskets of clothes, and we'd change our clothing. You'd take out your clothing, you know, it had your name on it, and put on your uniform or whatever you wore that night. And the kids would wear these little miniature military uniforms. And then they would go out and do their training exercises. They were learning how to march, how to shoot. I mean, every, I mean, I, all kids in Illuminati know um, at least, in, in that area, know how to like take apart a gun, put it together, and, and shoot with deadly accuracy by the age of eight years old. Um, martial arts, there's a lot of martial arts training. Sometimes that helps supervise that, or fill in if, if a military trainer was, because you know, you had to know how to do it. Everyone had to be, there's a lot of cross training. But most of the time, I supervised the training. I would be working on um, implementing programming or or what I call, we call tuning up, you know, um, reinforcing previously install programming in adults. At that point, I was normally supervising the younger trainers. They would be doing it, and I would be there watching and making sure they did it correctly. Um, or I'll, um, I would be also evaluating, like, whether sometimes every once in a while we'd be doing, we'd be, be working on something that was somewhat experimental, and then I'd be, and then I would be taking a more active role assessing the person's responses to, to the new protocol, recording it, and and if there was any difference, difference between established parameters for that protocol or expected responses, you know, I'd be flagging that. Give me an example of someone that you were working on. What? Uh, how would they be introduced? What would be the reason? Are they in the military? What is? Uh, how does someone get sent to you? No, these were all members of the group. Oh, okay. Oh, oh in fact, well, in fact, I, I can tell you that in San Diego. Twenty percent of the active members of the group were active military. Okay. Okay, and think military intelligence. Think high-ranking um, officials, colonels, um, <laughs> you know, commanders. My ex-husband was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, getting ready to become a commander. Okay. All right. These are not stupid people. So you're basically involved in pro- working on the programming of the members involved, too. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. We didn't program people that weren't members of the group. You cannot install significantly traumatic mind control programming in a person who is not a member of the group. Now, there are okay. certain um, – now, what you can do is what we call passive programming, which is basically through media means. You know, you can set if, if someone's watching a television program, they go immediately into alpha state. Everyone in the group, I mean, even the baby in the group knows that because because these people are very much into behavioral psychology, and that's a, a trance state almost, a very relaxed state where messages can be implemented. And that's why I very strongly suggest people be very careful about the TV shows they watch. That's all I'll say about that. But, but, no, you cannot take an adult who's not a member of the group and do what we did to them. They would go psychotic or or they, they wouldn't survive it, probably. They wouldn't be uh, able to us, psychologically handle it. Tell us some examples of what you were doing, program techniques. Sometimes it would involve, uh, sometimes normally it would start with a hypnotic induction or even sometimes we'd inject a medication. A lot of times, especially young children, have a lot of fear when they're going into programming, but adults did too. We want them to relax. We'd give them a very short-acting uh, medication to relax them. We would then um, invoke a hypnotic state in them. We would then um, 
like if it's an older person, I'd be checking that the code's already installed. If I was getting ready to install programming in it, in like a young child, I would tell them, explain to them very patiently exactly the behavior expected. I'd say, I want you to do this and this and this. I'd break it up into steps, and I'd say, first, we're going to practice this. I would show the child what I want them to do. I'd model it. I would then tell the child, do it. The child would then do it, okay, but normally they won't do it well the first time, so she would, she or he would get shot. That was called, because the group very much uses what they call positive and negative reinforcement. Okay, if the child did not do it perfectly the first time, they're shocked. That's the negative reinforcement. Then I'd say, do it again. They would show me the behavior. Now, at this point, we start associating the, the behavior with an external stimulus or cue, too. Now, a lot of times the child is, if, if this is a behavior, though, that we want associated with a specific code, the child will often then traumatize very heavily first to create a fragmentation in their personality. And then the code, and then the behavior and the associated cue are given. Like, you might hear a tone like, bing, bing, bing. All right, I want you to do this, bing, bing, bing. The child hears the tone, they get up, and they do the behavior. Once they can perform it perfectly, they're rewarded with praise, good job, or a hug, children like hugs, or something like that. Then you do it over and over and over. That's why trainers have to be very patient people. Um, because then maybe after the child's done it 50 times, then they hear the cue, they get up, they do it. it it's not even a, a conscious, it's, it's reflexive. At that point, it's considered installed. For very, very important programming, I'm talking about like like end level assassin programming because we did train people how to assassinate people, and that's a whole other topic that I don't want to go into here. Um, okay. We, we would then do a ritual to to heal the programming afterwards. Okay. Okay. You know something? Just uh, I was just looking at some of your articles. One was Christmas in the cult. Just to get off on a different subject here, sure. and you say this is quite different for you when you were growing up than it is for most children. Can you just kind of briefly tell us what you meant by that? Yeah, um, I mean, we had trees and presents and things like that. But for most children, Christmas is just happy time, you know, lots of presents. But in the group, not, some very high ceremonies that are celebrated. Uh, several times, that many times, I flew to, to Germany, and there um, there was no Santa Claus. They had a figure called Father Yule, who is... Mm -hmm who represents Christmas there, but he is not the kind of benevolent Santa that you see here. This is a man with a golden scepter dressed in a white robe and a golden sash around, and I was once um, at the German father's house where there was a gathering of children and adults, and, and Father Yule was present, and he raises the scepter and basically um, strikes down a child in front of everyone. Oh, my God. I know, strikes down I know. the child? Or Yes, he struck down the child with his, his, his scepter, and that that is not what you call a happy Christmas, you know. No. Now, at the same time, yes, we did have tree, and, you know, and, and fruitcake and all that and, and decorate the house, but there's another side to Christmas. It's, it's, uh, you know, I'm just listening, and I just can't believe, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we got leaders in our country that have probably gone through this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, it's just incredible, this group. I mean, I know they've been around for a long, long time, thousands of years, and gone through, came here, George Washington was a 33rd degree Mason, oh, yeah. uh, and we go on. Uh, the question, you know, I just, I want you to, uh, to understand, what, just from my point of view, I, I just wonder how, you know, you write a story, The End of the Illumina, how do we get rid of these people? I know you're out of it. Uh, you couldn't take it anymore, but do you think we can we can inspire more mid-level people to just leave like you, so they have no one to do this kind of insidious, crazy uh, programming and lifestyle? Uh, what what do you what do you think? Well, I believe that that as strongly as a Christian, that it's a spiritual warfare as as well as a, a emotional and psychological warfare. I believe that by the grace of God. But I will also say that when I was in the group, a lot of the members are not happy. You you will have people in the group that are there because they love it, because they believe in the goals, they're totally dedicated. But to be honest, a lot I knew also knew as many people who would have left in a minute if they thought that they could get out and make it. And you know, about your husband, uh, just yeah. to break in and then go back to that, do, do, do they marry you to somebody in the group, or is that yes. forced on yes. you? 
No, in the in the group, the marriages are always arranged. In my my experience, in my thirty eight years in the group, I never knew of a couple in in the Illuminati that did not have an arranged marriage. It's, it's Let me just mention planned. a couple that I I suspect Clinton and uh, Bill and Hillary. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, definite, definite. Yes, and, Bill. And yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and yeah, a lot okay. of times these marriages are arranged for compatibility, but also for bloodlines, to bring the right bloodlines. Well, we're together. back on the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Fred Szymanski. And let me tell you, as an interviewer, um, someone who has researched the Illuminati uh, for a long time, it started way back when, uh, when I was a young reporter in Rome, it's a whole different ballgame when you're actually talking to someone with experiences like this. It takes it out of that realm of what is quasi-fiction fact uh, into the realm of reality, and it's 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 uh, it's really shocking. In the, and, and I'll be honest with you, uh, this is a story uh, that folks you have to listen to because this is going on in our country. All the things you're seeing regarding uh, our rights being taken away, the police state, uh, the war in Iraq, 9/11, all these things have to do with this powerful group. And uh, Zvali, you know, you're talk, we're talking about mid-level people, then we're going to talk about mm-hmm. some of the lower-level people. I'm interested who they are. But I imagine a lot of these, you said they weren't happy, but a lot of them probably stay because it's very, I mean, this is a, this, it's a very, uh, very lucrative uh, way to live. I imagine you, you from oh, wealthy yeah. families. Oh, yeah. In fact, and that's the main thing that, that's one of the factors that keeps people in. The reason more people don't leave is because leaving means giving up your husband, your children, your entire family on both sides, your money, and basically for a lot of and, and for a lot of people leaving the group, it means giving up everything and starting out penniless and alone. And not only that, but then you're you're combating internal programming to recontact, to go back, to be loyal, to be a good member. Mm-hmm. And and I've known many people that tried to leave and went back because they just couldn't take it. Do you, uh, do you want to take a phone call right now to break it up? Sure. Okay, uh, Marilyn in California. You're on the investigative journal, Marilyn. Yes, I've been uh, uh, just sort of caught part of this. I lost part of it. I'm li- listening on the Internet, but I didn't quite catch it. How did this woman become involved in this Illuminati training? Uh, go ahead. Uh, can you explain that, Zvali? Yes. Yeah. I was taught it from early childhood. I was mentored into it. Uh, trainers in the group are mentored. You, you work with older adults, and they show you, and you are given increasing responsibility until by the time you're in your teens, you are basically doing adult training responsibilities. You've been taught for years. Parents put you in it, or? Yes, they were members. Oh, I see. So it comes down through the parent, one parent to another. Are yeah, these, or, are, or, or from both. Are they private schools? Do what? Are these private schools? Well, when my children were schooled at private Christian schools, they were all Illuminati. Oh, okay. you're saying that the Christian schools are Illuminati? Some of them are. Not all, but some. No, I'll I'm be- not, no, no. The, the ones that my children were in were specifically. But, no, there's a lot of good Christian schools that have nothing to do with the group, but some can be. Now, I went to a public school, but what's interesting is out of three public schools I went to as a young child, two have burned down. So there's no access to any school records. I'll be John. Uh, Marilyn, just to get you up to speed, uh, uh, you're born into this, uh, then you're trained as a young child, you go through an induction ceremony in the Vatican, and this is uh, going on with 1% to 2% of our population, according to Zvali, very serious uh, in all levels, government and everything else. Go ahead, Marilyn, you have another question? Yeah, when you say uh, uh, the Vatican, now that is not a Christian religion. Okay, so I mean, I'm a Christian. But we do yeah. not look at Catholics as a Christian religion. We look at them as the precursor of the uh, New World religion. So with well, you know, if I may just break in, I was grew, I, grew, I grew up a Catholic. I don't get involved in the splicing of the religions. I'm basically stating that when I started uh, researching the Illuminati as a reporter in Rome, and I realized there was a bad portion of the church, I, I looked at it. I had to deal with the evil and the good. And so that's the way I reconcile that the evil within the Catholic Church uh, okay. at the high level of the Vatican, which seeps down into many, many areas. Go ahead. Okay, well, I won't, just, I won't argue that yeah, point. I yeah, don't yeah. agree with it. But, 
But uh, it sounds like you have become possibly born again to get out of this. Could I be correct in that? Yes, yes, Marilyn, very much. Now, first, I do want to say I am not slamming the Catholic Church or, or well, the average Catholic. I have many good friends that are Catholics that are strong Christians. I became a Christian, and that's the only way I could get out. But just so you know, though, too, a lot of card-carrying aluminists, well, we don't really carry cards, but I'm using that term. Yes. Our members of the Baptist Church, our members of Pentecostal churches, it, it in fact, I was on a worship team for a Wesleyan church in San Diego in my day life. Okay? Okay. Because, uh, yeah, because, I'm just very, very confused. I mean, I, I, uh, I think this is interesting. And, and, and as far, you know, many people say that the Catholic Church will be the forerunner of the new world religion. There's some very good books out. In fact, I think you may have interviewed one of these men, the uh, Grand Plan designed by John Daniel. Uh-huh. Do you remember that? Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, okay, but go the ahead. average Catholic has no idea of what's going on in the Vatican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. think that's interesting that that the average Catholic would not go what's going on. That's just my take on it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. As an average Catholic going to Rome, my first time in 1980, I didn't know what was going on, and I grew up as a Catholic, went to Notre Dame High School. It was quite a learning experience for me. Why, why do Catholics, when they find out how evil the church is, stay in it? I mean, do they really, why would they want to stay in it? That's what bothers me. I know some good people that are like that, and I don't get it. <laughs> well, that, the only answer, there's, there's uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there are many Catholics that aren't actively practicing. Yeah. Thank but you. anyway, we'll leave that for another time. Thanks a lot, Marilyn. Uh, we'll be back on the Investigative Journal in three minutes with Zvali. Okay, uh, you know, they're not going to get me, that's for sure. My house is anti-illuminated. Uh, it's not going to happen, uh, folks. And, uh, you know, just to end that, Svali, before I get back to you, uh, just to end that conversation we had with Marilyn about c Catholicism, I look back and I really thank my dad. Um, and I, I do it in kind of a way, I'm just thinking about it now, I didn't know what the church was about. But, you know, something strange did happen when I was young. Uh, my mom died and I was uh, 10 years old. My brother was six months old. At the time, she died of leukemia. It was a very, very tragic uh, affair. It left my dad and me and my brother alone. And I remember my dad literally took a, uh, a priest, a head monsignor in our parish, and it was, I won't even tell you where, St. John Brebeuf, right outside of Chicago. And uh, this man came into our house, I'll never forget it, and said that he was going to put me and my little brother in an orphanage. And my dad literally picked him up and threw him out the door, literally. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, my dad never went back to church again. My brother never went to a Catholic school. I, of course, uh, asked if I could finish only because I had friends there. But, you know, who knows what would have happened uh, looking back on what's the, uh, the craziness that goes on in the church. But anyways, while you were talking about, uh, you know, something, these people that, are too, that do not want to get out because of the financial ties. But let's go back when you were in the uh, Illuminati and how did this happen? How did you finally leave? And tell us this whole story. Uh, about you leaving the Illuminati. We haven't touched on that yet. Sure. Well, I do want to say one thing that I agreed with Marilyn on. Without faith in God, I couldn't have done it because I became a Christian, and that that was, for me, revolutionary because it made me question, again, more of what I was being taught or had believed all my life. I for the, began to realize that what I was doing was wrong. I became increasingly cynical. And... I also then start standing up to the head trainer in the county who despised me because he would do things that were just blatantly cruel for no reason whatsoever. I'd say, you're wrong. Well, people don't like that. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he, he, would, he took it out on me in a lot of horrible ways. But I finally made the decision to run. I ran to, this, to another state because I knew that my chances of getting out while still staying in that area with people I knew surrounded by people who were in the group, was not going to be very good. So I went to another state. I, uh, after well, You had to leave your family and everything, right? Everything. But, well, my children were with, with, with their grandparents, and at that point I thought that was better than them being with my husband, and I was going to go get my kids. But my husband then called, and he said, I want to reunite with you. And I said, okay, that's you know, that's wonderful. And I said, but you have to get help. You have to get some treatment because we can't go on. You've got to get out of the group. And he said, okay. He said, I'll pick up the kids and meet you in a week. So, you know, the day before he called, said, I'll be there tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. 
And so I was excited thinking, oh, he's getting out, he's getting out, that's wonderful. Instead, he went, he had gotten the kids several days before. He was lying to me, I didn't know it. I had gone to a judge, and the day that he was supposed to arrive, there was a knock on my door. It was the policeman serving me uh, di- uh, uh, divorce papers and mm-hmm. also a restraining order saying that I could not come with 100 yards of my husband or my children. And at that point, I felt slightly punished for leaving the group. Um, I fought that, and it, I fought for four years with a court system that said that things like this didn't occur because my husband would go into court and say, this woman's psychotic. She's making it all up. There's no way. Ha, ha, ha. This stuff doesn't happen in this day and age, and the judge would say, you're right, slam. Full custody to the father, and I had to have supervised visitation for four years with my own children so that because I was considered a kidnap risk. Um, but through a lot of prayer, I had my whole church praying for me here in Texas, um, and through what I believe are a series of miracles, my children were finally allowed unsupervised visitation with me after four years. And during that time, I, I, I said to my daughter, who was 14, I said, I want so badly for you to get out. And she looks at me, and she starts going, oh, you shouldn't have said that, Mom. You shouldn't have said that, Mom. Yeah, she, just, she just freaked out. She just totally lost it. And I realized it was her mm-hmm. programming cycling because she was just terrified. You, you know, she was like, why did you say that? Why did you say that? You know, and I said, it's okay, it's okay, honey. Calm down, calm down. And then finally, she, she, she was just shaking and shaking. And then finally she said, well, I don't want to go back and get hurt. And then I said, you don't have to. And at that point, I faced federal prison, but I called my, my ex and I said, I will face, I will not let those children go back and get hurt again. And he okay. flew out, he flew out to get them. And he could have put me in prison at the time because I was breaking the, the custody visitation. And you know how strong the courts are on that? Mm-hmm. And I said, I said to him, I said, please, you're, Look at, because when my, my daughter and son said, we don't want to go back, Dad. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to do this anymore. And he looked at them, and he said, I want to go think about it. And so he went, he, he went home, and I was praying for him at the time. And then that night he called me and he says, oh, my God, oh, my God. And so he said, we've got to get out. We've got to get out. And I'm like, yes, you do. And, he, he, I mean, he, he, and then he said, because he, and then he he made the decision to to get out. At that point, he went to a notary public. He gave me and he 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 did a legal case document, gave me full custody of my children. And then he said he was so sorry for it. He put me through the H E L L. He put me through for years. Now, have you had any reprisals from anybody in the group since you leaving, or any warnings? To yeah. Keep quiet. Or oh anything yeah. Like oh that? yeah. Of course. I mean, and there's one time when. Um, I did write one article that named some specific dates and times, and I uh, I got hurt afterwards, and it, it made me very cautious. And that's why I, I don't give a lot of radio interviews and why I don't okay. do a lot of this. That's one reason why. Um, well, I, I appreciate get... this because, you know, the number of people you're going to help, I maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, waking up the American people, what's really going on. Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, uh, you can wake up many more people by a person like you than talking about a hundred million different generalities. Let me take a call, Chris uh, in Washington. You're on the Investigative Journal. Hi, um, Smalley. I just want to uh, say how much I appreciate your bravery in um, presenting this information in the way that you are. I've read your website recently, and my question is very simple. Um, based on the information that you're presenting. I'm wondering what timeline um, the uh, the organization of uh, of the larger family that you're describing has for um, implementing the uh, the new world order. Okay, I was told it would occur during my generation. I was told that by the year 2050 um, that they would be revealed. Now. Again, their timelines changed, though. In fact, I kind of, I think, jokingly referred to them as being like the Soviet Union because, you know, how they had their five- and ten-year plans and then things always got changed. In my own lifetime, I saw several different timelines for things that were supposed to occur change. But as Greg noted, um, I've also heard of from different people that actually there, there's a huge push in the last few years. It's like it's close, it's close, let's make things happen more quickly. So I, so I couldn't begin to guess whether that's an accurate timeline or not. I know what I was told. 
I have a follow-up question, and that's it, um, and this will be it. I, I have recently, against my own um, resistance to doing so, investigated, started to investigate fringe matters, if you will. Among mm -hmm. them, uh, the you know the upcoming uh, date on the Mayan calendar of 2012, uh -huh. and. As I've done this research, it's um, I've allowed myself just to be open to this information without believing anything I'm reading. And mm -hmm. one of the one of the ideas that's presenting itself is, is that around 2012, not just according to the Mayan calendar, but many other theories out there, that we will be undergoing as a planet a revolutionary shift, if you will, of some kind or another. Um, and I'm wondering in the back of my mind if there might be any kind of uh, race against the clock on that scale, if you will, especially if we're talking about a potential spiritual warfare, oh, using yeah. your words, in, in, in play here. Do you see a possible relation there? Yes, I do. And and uh, 2012 is an important year, but, um, again, I, I was not told that the final revealing would occur then, but I believe that Paul, what will happen is there will be events taking place that will help to set the stage. Um, okay. There's going to be, I was told, and again, I'm telling you what I was told while a member of the group, so please take it with a grain of salt because, as I know, these people aren't always honest or trustworthy. They are deceptive. But I was told that there would be an enormous economic collapse prior to the revealing, that, that basically um, the stock market would destabilize. Well, that appears to be already happening. Yeah, yeah. And... Well, and uh, and and it's. I was told it make the Great Depression look like Sunday school, and and at that time, it's it's going to be. They're going to really be manipulating finances to bring about chaos, confusion, warfare, and then. I mean, but see, I don't like to be so negative. I'm just, but I am telling you what I was taught when I was in the group. You know. Well, I so I mean, appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I'm they, sure we all do. Yeah, and so... You're a great that, voice. Well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate that very much. And I, But out of this chaos, they said, would come order. See, the, the group believes that out of chaos comes order. Well, yeah, I, well I as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, I'd rather uh, just, uh, you know, let things, uh, you know, Svali, these guys want to bring down this country financially, whatever way possible, and right now, your voice is important in that. And, Chris, I really appreciate you saying that because we want to stop these guys. I mean, come on. Uh, let's get uh, American people to get together and just put an end to this. We have a powerful group in numbers. We may not have the money, but we can take it back. Take it back. And uh, I don't want to be bullied by these kind of people. That's my feeling. Yeah. Uh, let me take another call. Uh, Harper in Canada. Can you Harper? Hi, yeah, can go you? ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead. Great, thanks, Greg. And Savali, I read your um, your expose when it came out in Sweet101.com a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I always wondered what happened to you because you vanished from Sweet101. So it's great to hear about you. A couple quick questions. I'll make them real fast. First is the term Moriah conquering wind. I'd never heard that before or since I read it in your expose. I wondered if you could elaborate on that term a little bit. I also wanted to ask you if these, this cult, um, as far as you know, claims to or believes to derive any of its heritage from Atlantis or any other um, lost civilization. Okay. okay. I'm not All sure right. about the reference to Mariah you're describing, because Mariah is, is I mean, but I can I certainly address the second question. Um, the Illuminati completely believe that Atlantis is real. They teach it to their children as part of the oral history. They believe it was the, one of the greatest civilizations that ever existed and one of the most advanced. And what they teach, their their take on it is that Atlantis was a great race of highly intelligent um, people who uh, who had a highly advanced state but, and who were highly enlightened. And what, what they but what they teach the Illuminati children is that then this prophet of the enemy, who is the prophet of God, came and, and foretold their destruction if they didn't change their ways. Because they were definitely occultists. They were Luciferian on Atlantis. I mean, that was the the religion. And in fact, a lot of the advances that Atlantis enjoyed was was 
passed down to them through supernatural means is, is what I'll say. And so so they laughed at the prophet and they kept, they in fact they 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 killed him. And he, I guess sometime afterwards we were taught that a few inhabitants escaped but that the that but tragically the great city was lost. And and the Illuminati to this day mourn the loss of Atlanta because they feel that, that these were that the few survivors that left were, were among the the, the great um, people who helped found the, what you call the precursors of, of Illuminism. One more quick question, if I may. And I wanted to Go ask ahead. you if you have any reason to believe that the people, men and or women, at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, practice a kind of magic where they are kind of skipping through time, in other words. Oh, oh yes. Oh, well, you know, well, leaving one it, body, it, leaving oh, the yeah, solar yeah. spirit, leaving one body and coming and being born into another one, and they're, therefore, oh, yeah. you know, living through oh, yeah. time. All the time. In fact, see, now this, now I didn't go there in this interview because you start sounding wacko if you start discussing things like that. But the, in the spiritual side, they very much teach things like time travel, traveling out of body, um, you know, uh, psychic battling, um, things like that, things that cannot be explained by logic. And I saw things that I cannot explain through human intellect or reasoning that were highly supernatural and involve all of that and more. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to speak with you, man. God bless okay, you. Okay, thanks, Harper. Uh, I think we have Dave Wilcox called in. I think you know uh, Dave through emails. Uh, yes. Uh, Zvali. Dave, uh, you want to say hello and they have a question for Zvali? Sure. Uh, Zvali, it's great to have you on the air. I'm really glad you decided to do it. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dave. It's good to talk with you. Yeah, I feel like you're an old friend. I've been reading your stuff for so long, and um, you share so willingly and openly about yourself. It's a real honor to be able to speak with you in person like this. Well, Go ahead, well, Dave. You may have something you want to say to Zavali. Go ahead. Sure. Um, Question? I, I think one of the things I'd really like to have covered here is you shared with me in an email recently about these stages of enlightenment that they try to guide people through. Yes. And I would like you to try to sketch out for people how – the behavioral conditioning that's coming through the media and the movies and so forth might have affected them. In other words, what personality characteristics would you see in a person when they have been influenced by these teachings? How would the average person who's not really a bad person start to be leaning if the Illuminati teachings were actually having an effect on them? What would they be like? What would start happening? Well, again, as I said, the average person is not going to be a member of the group, so the influence right. would be much less. But the media, I believe that, well, in fact, I know, I don't believe, I know that some of the media that we're seeing nowadays is specifically targeted towards teaching people their philosophy or goals. All you have to do is watch a children's cartoon on Saturday morning, and almost across the board you'll see morphing, power battles, occult, and that's intentional. Um movies coming out. But basically, if a person's being influenced by their teachings, that person will learn to not trust their own instincts, their own feelings, their own body, their own perceptions. They'll be looking outside for guidance. Second of all, they will be moving towards a heavily um, occultic worldview. That, 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 you know, that um, leaning upon the occult is very heavily encouraged. All you have to do is watch Harry Potter <laughs> yeah, know? I mean, the, the whole I mean, idea sorry, of the... Sorry. I mean, not to slam one of the most popular movies, but yes, I mean, or The Matrix. If you want to know pure and luminous philosophy, The Matrix shows it. Oh, yeah. The entire... Right down it. with uh, Morpheus being broken down with the injections, and they said that it's like hacking computer. Yeah. Okay, uh, exactly. we're going to take a break. We'll come back with our final segment, a uh, big finish on the investigative journal with uh, Raleigh on the Public Broadcasting Network. Okay, uh, we're back with our final segment with Bali, and uh, she's telling us uh, about her experiences 30 years uh, with this insidious group, the Illuminati, and how deeply penetrated and filtrated they are in our culture and our, in our country. Bali, we talked about the higher levels, uh, the middle levels you were involved in uh, as a head trainer. Uh, how low do they go? I mean, I've said all along they're involved in gang stalking, the MK Ultra program, uh, infiltrating truth organizations, uh, infiltrating uh, groups that are trying to do good. Uh, how far down do they go? Well, they go down to the sister group level that I mentioned. And most sister groups have anywhere from 
usually roughly around uh, 30 members. And those are what a lot of people would consider the, what you think of as satanic calls with the high priest and priestess. That would be the lower, le- the local level, the lower level. But those people are also very active in their community. And so they will be involved in infiltrate, infiltrating activities when possible. Because to them, it's not infiltrating, it's helping, they think they're helping the group or helping people by becoming a member and, and spreading the influence. Let me uh, squeeze in one more caller, Roger, a faithful listener. Roger, uh, you're on the investigative journal. Uh, yeah, thanks. I had so big a question in so little time, but uh, maybe I just will squeeze it. Had a couple of minutes. Yeah. Really try to work it in, Roger. Yeah, uh, well, you'll enjoy this first. And that is, I recall when Charlotte Iserbeat was here on the local Clear Channel radio show, and the host was, of course, dismissive of an Illuminati agenda. It was great to hear Charlotte say, you're telling me my my own father was a high, and she, of course, was a first or second fiddle secretary at the Department of Ed. And she says, you're telling me my own father on his deathbed was telling me, you go get him, girl. And he was <laughs> one of them. And so that was great. Anyway, uh, I was going, my question was towards the uh, philosophical religious uh, motivators, if you will, which you've been dwelling on. And I've been, I've been trying to form it up into a more cohesive uh, integration. Yeah, try to make it quick. We're running out of time. Go ahead. Yeah, to expose the ethos of the, uh, you know, it's like the neocons serve as the pseudo-intellectual rationale for the Illuminati agenda, and uh, I, I don't presume that it turns on such fine uh, distinctions uh, so much as it is a bare-knuckled lust for power, but everybody has sort of a worldview that uh, they used to justify their actions, and uh, of course uh, it's the most unconservative humanistic uh, social engineering agenda on a far larger scale. And now, you mentioned about these people are basically, and it's rare as hand teeth. Quick, Roger. Yeah, to find somebody that's not uh, uh, oxymoronically both uh, uh, a spiritualist and a cultist and also a, a, a what do you call, a, a hard a core a rationalist, or maybe that's just for public consumption, right? I know there was a question there somewhere, Roger, but anyway, uh, thanks for calling. Let me, I only got a minute. I got to finish with Zvali. Uh, Zvali, uh, tell us in your own words, you got a, about a minute or two left here. Uh, the real, you went forward, you, you came forward, you're now living a life, uh, completely away from them. What's your hopes of, uh, the future in our country right now? I, my hope is that people realize that this is happening and that they will start doing something about it that they will start looking at. Now, again, we're talking about people who are immensely wealthy, so it won't be easy. But if people could rise up in prayer and just say, this isn't okay, if people will become informed enough to want to learn more about it, be aware they exist, and then possibly pray. Pray that people will, will take action against the things that are happening. Because okay, so Molly, I'm, okay. We're, okay. we're all out of time. I, we're going to end on that prayer. I really thank you for coming forward. Uh, you're very courageous. We'll talk again. And I'll be back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. Same time, same place.